If I give you a list of numbers like 98305, the computation of the average is very simple. You simply take those numbers, you add them all up, you divide out by the number of them, you divide out by 5, and that gives you your average. Now, in this video, we want to extend this concept, the average of a bunch of numbers, to the idea of the average of a function. And to begin that journey, what I'm going to do is show how to interpret this geometrically. What I mean by that is, I'm going to take a graph, and what I've done on this graph is I put in a list of points where the y values of those points are just the numbers that we began with, the 9, 8, 3, 0, 5. And that the x values are evenly spaced a distance of 1. And then when I've got these points, I can do a sort of right rectangle thing where I come along and I put a rectangle that goes from the x-axis all the way up to the points. And because the width of all of these little rectangles is just this value of 1, what it means is that the area of a rectangle, which is base times height, a base of 1 and a height, whatever the value of that point was. So in other words, if I take the sum of the areas of all of these rectangles, I get precisely the average value that we began with. And in my formalism, I write it with my sigma notation, my sum from 1 up to 5 as I have 5 rectangles, and I call it the rectangle sub i to denote the ith rectangle. So this has been one way to interpret the average of a list of numbers in this sort of geometric way. But now let me turn to a function. So let's imagine that instead of a list of numbers, I have a function, which is sort of a continuum of a bunch of different numbers. How could I define and compute the average of something like that? Well, one thing I could do is I could approximate this with just a bunch of points. So for instance, let me just put these points on this particular graph, and the y values of those points are the same 9, 8, 3, 0, 5 we've seen before. Indeed, I can put the right rectangles here. So this is almost the same thing, but the only real difference here is that the y value of my points I'm now thinking of as being f of whatever the x values are, f of x1, f of x2, and so on. Now, the choice of five points was just completely arbitrary. Could I not do a better approximation if I add ten points? So, so let's do that. If I add ten different points on, I have a right rectangle sort of approximation there, and indeed I can be better again by going to twenty different rectangles. Now, there's a crucial thing to pay attention to here, which is the width of these rectangles. They're no longer one like they were at the beginning, now I've got a little delta x, and indeed, my delta x in generally is b minus a divided out by n, so in this case, 5 divided by 20, as I've taken a width of 5 and divided it into 20 different subintervals. Okay, so now let's think about what the average value should be. The average of a list of points, of these f of x1 down to f of x20, well, you take the sum of all the values, and then you divide out by the 20. In general, you divide out by n. So my general formula for the average is going to be the sum from 1 up to n, where n's my number of subdivisions, the f of xi, and then I have to multiply by that 1 over n. That's dividing out by the number I have. But this 1 over n here, this looks familiar to us, that we have a 1 over n in my delta x formula. Indeed, I can replace the 1 over n with simply delta x divided by b minus a. Well, now this should look really familiar, because a sum of f of xi's delta x, we've seen that before. The sum of f of xi delta x is just the area under the curve. This is the definition of the integral in the limit as n goes to infinity. So if I just do a finite approximation, this is approximately going to be the integral from a up to b of f of x dx, but I have to divide out by the b minus a. So there it is. There is my average value formula for a curve. It is going to be 1 over b minus a times the interval under the curve from a to b of f of x dx. All right, so let's interpret this a couple of different ways, then we're going to do a concrete example. I'm going to go and first of all draw my function, and what I've given here is a horizontal line, and that horizontal line has the height of whatever f averages. So I figured out this f average, I've gone and computed it at some number, and I'm going to go and just draw it on my graph. Now, what this gives me is a rectangle. The height of it is f average by construction, and the width of it is the b minus a. In this case, just 5. So if I look at the area of this rectangle that I have, so base times height, the b minus a times the f average, 
which is 1 over b minus a times the integral. So the area of this rectangle is the same thing as the area under the curve. It's the same thing as the integral from a up to b of f of x dx. So really what the average does is it takes some curve thing that has some weird area underneath of it, and it replaces that with a simple rectangle with the exact same area. Now, I want to note this is highly, highly sensitive on the a and the b. If you change the a and the b, you get very different values. So for example, if I animate this a little bit, what you can see is that as I take my, in this case, b value and move it along here, what the f average is changes. So you can't just say you have a function, you have to have a function on a particular interval to compute out whatever its average value is. One more interpretation for you. I've got the same f average horizontal line, but now I have shaded in the difference between the function and its average. And sometimes you get a region which is going to be above the f average line and sometimes below. Now, in my general formula, the f average is 1 over b minus a, the integral from a to b of f of x dx, my basic average value formula. I'm going to take that f av and I'm going to move it into the integral sign like this. Now, the reason I am allowed to do that is that f average is just some particular value. And if it's some number and I integrate it, you would get that number times b minus a. And so if you divide out by b minus a, it cancels, and so you're allowed to do this. But what this formula tells me is that effectively the integral of this difference, the parts I've shaded, has to be zero. So that means the positive contributions have to add up to being equal to the negative contributions. Or the way I can interpret it is that this one region at the top here that's above f average, its area has to be the same thing as the area of all the stuff beneath it. So the f average sort of cuts this exactly in two. You have some portions of area which are above it and some portions which are beneath it, and it has to add up to exactly zero. So the region above and the regions below are precisely the same area. Final thing, let's do one computation, the kind of thing that often appears on tests. I've got some function x squared here, I've got some interval, the zero to two, and I want to go and just compute out what is the average value of this function on this interval. Well, my generic formula, as you know, is the 1 over b minus a, integral from a to b of f of x dx, the a and the b are the 0 and the 2, so I plug those in, and I plug in the x squared for my function, so that just leaves me with this. And then if I actually want to go and compute out what this is going to be, well, the integral of x squared is x cubed over 3, so I can plug in the values of 2 and 0, and I get 4 thirds. So what we've been able to do in this video is to define the average value of a function on an interval. We've been able to compute it out in specific examples, and we've been able to see what that means geometrically.